My name is Laura Secor. I'm a journalist. I've written on Iran for The New Yorker, and I'm currently working on a book about Iran. And I have the great pleasure today of introducing Vali Nasser, who is a leading authority on the Middle East with particular expertise on Iran and Pakistan. He is a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy of Tufts University and an adjunct senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's the author of five books, including most recently an influential and widely acclaimed study called The Shia Revival, How Conflicts Within Islam Will Shape the Future. His other works include Democracy in Iran and The Islamic Leviathan, Islam and the Making of State Power. His latest project, his work in progress, will examine the importance of the private sector and the middle class in the transformation of the Middle East. It's called The Fateful Crescent, the commercial revolution that will transform the Muslim world. So in its first days on the, um, its first 100 days on the Iran portfolio, the Obama administration's boldest move seems to have been to send a clear message to the Iranian regime that the United States is looking for constructive dialogue. The response from Tehran was essentially, prove it, which some people have described as frosty and others have seen as cautiously receptive. But from there, we seem to have entered a sort of frozen situation until the next big event of uh, the next 100 days, which is Iran's June presidential election. What do you think the outcome of this election will tell us about the intentions of the Iranian regime toward the United States under this new administration? Uh, well, the elections are not uh, about a dialogue with the United States, but uh, the outcome of the election, without a doubt, will uh, decide the direction that Iran would go. I think these elections are probably the, the most important event on the calendar in terms of what might happen next. And as it turns out, I think they're also one of the most important elections that Iran has had, uh, particularly because of the policies that has been followed by the current president and uh, the, whether or not he gets another term to entrench these policies, both domestically as well as internationally, or whether Iran, after having experimented with this particular brand of bombastic foreign policy and populist uh, domestic politics, is, is sort of had enough and would like to go to somewhere uh, a little bit more uh, uh, pragmatic, uh, and then uh, you know look at the world and look at the domestic situation from there. So I think we won't know uh, because the elections will first of all decide the main interlocutor for the international community. It will decide the. Uh, direction that Iran wants to go uh, internationally. And it also, uh, the, the elections has an impact of deciding which constituency within Iran would be dominant. Mm -hmm. The hardline militants or the sort of more pragmatic in the middle. And those communities have very different view of the world, of Iran's role in the region, of Iran's behavior internationally. Uh, and, and therefore, which of these communities come up top will be very decisive. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Ahmadinejad came to power on this populist platform and a sort of a program of economic populism. That has coincided with a major change in the global financial markets and with a precipitous drop in the price of oil. How do you think those developments are likely to affect the political outlook in Iran in advance of these elections? Well, it would be very important. Ahmadinejad was very popular with the poor because uh, much like Chavez in Venezuela, he took the oil money, which was quite considerable when oil was around $150 a barrel. Iran was expecting something like $250 billion in oil revenue in 2007-2008, uh, and essentially spend this on the public. Uh, and go out there and give handouts to people, give uh, cheap loans for building of houses, promise roads, hospitals, uh, whatever he could to the poor. Uh, but when the oil prices went down to around uh, uh, $40 a barrel, all of a sudden people looked and saw that Iran's uh, sovereign fund is no more than somewhere between nine to $25 billion, depending on who's talking about it. So most of the money has been wasted and uh, he's created expectations among the public that the Iranian government cannot possibly meet. Uh, he, in the process, has also generated a lot of inflation by just putting money out there. But the money has not really produced jobs. It has not actually created a self-sustaining economy. And then his foreign policy has brought a lot more international pressure on Iran, which means that uh, investment has dried up in Iran. Uh, there's not, uh, it's much more difficult to do banking for Iranians. 
And when the Iranians look at the economic picture, it's not a rosy one. Now, whatever a regime thinks about you know, foreign policy, thinks about domestic politics, thinks about Islam, any regime would have to first think about its survival. And if I were you know, sitting in the supreme leader's chair, I would wonder whether Iran's economy uh, right now, at this point in time, it's its most sort of, uh, um, what do you call it, th biggest threat to the stability of this regime. It's not the outside world. It's not reform movement. It's not democracy. It's, as we would say, it's the economy is stupid. And, and, and Ahmadinejad is extremely vulnerable because he has, in fact, taken a fairly stable Islamic Republic and has taken it to a place where it's much more precarious. Mm -hmm. And when they look at the, at the picture for their own longevity and they look at the fragility of the economic situation, what side do you think they see their bread buttered on? Do they, is it in their interest to institute a far-reaching program of economic reform, or is that likely to actually um, make the situation even more unstable? Or is it in their interest simply to roll back the sort of um, the excesses of the Ahmadinejad administration and try to find an equilibrium? I think probably some of both. There are two things that Ahmadinejad has done which has damaged Iran's economy. One is that anybody uh, with certain degree of sensibility and professionalism left the government. Uh, either, either he fired them uh, or, or they just didn't want to work with him. So uh, administration of the economy as well as administration of foreign policy, education, everything in Iran passed into the hands of ideologues who are not very good at what they do. So everybody thinks that the minimum gain that another president would bring to the table is, is better management of the economy. So you're just going to get a bounce by just having all those managers who were fired to come back. Mm -hmm. The second is that uh, populism really doesn't work uh, in Iran. I mean, it's shown that uh, you, you know, the government can put a lot of money out there, but it doesn't grow the economy and doesn't create jobs. I mean, you have to look at Iran as a country where majority of its population, somewhere between 60 to 65 percent, are considered youth, it has an unemployment rate of 35 percent plus, which means that you're sitting on a demographic time bomb, and you have to find a way for the economy to, to create jobs. Now, the government can't create jobs, and uh, increasingly people are saying that you know, the private sector can do more, and maybe we don't want to open the gates completely like China and India, but maybe even a little bit of space to the private sector will have a much bigger bang in terms of um, employment. And I think partly, uh, you know, for instance, the other presidential contenders that are running against Ahmadinejad are making a very big deal about the necessity of some degree of reform to stabilize the Iranian economy. And yet the main contender for the presidency is, um, is Mir Hossein Mousavi, who also has a background as a populist and also has a background as a hardliner on foreign policy. Do you believe that his views have changed? Do you believe that he would present a significant um, alteration of the course if he were elected? Well, you know, I think with Iran, we should not expect immediately that the regime itself is going to produce a drastically different uh, persona as its leader. I mean, you know, here the difference is between, you know, you're looking for a um, a Gorbachev as opposed to a Brezhnev uh, here. Uh, what, we, what we hope is that uh, a leader in Iran that is sort of much more pragmatic economically and much more pragmatic on foreign policy and looks to the middle class rather than the poor as its base of power is going to create a sufficient amount of a shift that that shift down the line will translate into something bigger. The Iranian regime right now through its own electoral process cannot produce a free market Democrat. Uh, it cannot bring a free market Democrat to the top. Uh, it can maybe just create a little bit of an axial shift in that direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and while you're putting yourself in the Supreme Leader's chair, um, I wonder if you, as you sort of look at the calculus that, that the leadership in Iran has to be weighing when they think about relations with the United States, and when they consider their own, the fragility of their own position and the obvious priority of the regime's survival. Do you think that they see it as in their interest to accept this opening? And um, if not, what might change that calculus? Well, I think 
The term interest matters. Uh, in other words, I think you know the, any any steps that the at least the ultimate decision maker in Iran or ultimate decision makers take would, would be in, in their mind something that serves their interest. Uh, we can have a debate about what is in Iran's interest. Uh, for instance, is it regime survival, as you said? Is it projection of power? But whatever way they calculate that, uh, the relations with the United States with, or with Europe or with the Arab world will come in that uh, uh, context. I think you know, you know you have very divergent uh, opinions in Iran's foreign policy establishment. There are those who could be seen as to be very bullish. They think Iran has done very well uh, in the region. It's a much bigger presence than it was. And then you are, there are those who think that, you know, uh, that Iran does have certain vulnerabilities, uh, including economic one, but also um, that it's now surrounded by conflicts on all the borders that you know, Afghanistan or Iraq uh, does cause certain worry for them, and that the energy markets are soft, and that they have to sit down and calculate as to how to best calibrate uh, uh, the, 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 the situation for themselves. I think, you know, the discussions will be focused on the nuclear issue because that's the pivotal issue for both Iran and the United States. But I think the calculations are, are much bigger. Right. One of the um, really interesting points in your forthcoming book has to do with the collapse of the global financial markets. And the, um, you suggest that actually the Islamic financial markets have been strengthened by this because they, these markets have been shielded from some of the um, I think as one of your sources put it, toxic assets and government takeovers that have plagued Western banks. Um, how do you see these markets? First, if you could tell us a little bit about what these Islamic markets consist of and how you see them possibly transforming the landscape in the Middle East. Well, you know, at the height of uh, the financial boom, uh, no, we didn't really have to think about money that was outside of, uh, you know, the main mainstream of finance. But there is a lot of money in the Muslim world, uh, not only in countries we're familiar with, like Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates, et cetera, which have a lot of oil money. But there's a lot of money in places that you don't even ex expect, like there's a lot of money in Pakistan, there's a lot of money in Iran. And uh, this money, ultimately, if it cannot be invested locally, tries to find its way elsewhere. And gradually, a sort of an international financial market has emerged. A lot of it centered on the city of Dubai in the Persian Gulf, with a lot of money coming from the rest of the Muslim world gets invested. Now, a lot of the Muslims uh, are also pious. And, and in Islam, it's not allowed for you to either charge usury or pay interest on loans. So they look for investments that, um, that are more like profit sharing or uh, risk sharing, but that you don't pay or receive interest. And if they couldn't find these, in, the, these investments, they just don't put their money out there. And uh, the, a sort of a global economy has begun, uh, global financial products have come about that now are tapping into this demand, which means anything from car loans to hedge funds to banking services have emerged that are trying to tap into this market. Now, the advantage, there are certain advantages to it, uh, given the current situation. One is one of the rules of Islamic uh, finance is that um, you cannot essentially speculate. You cannot uh, speculate on, on ether. There has to be a tangible asset associated with what you do. And as a result, they didn't buy into a lot of the, as you call it, toxic financial uh, services. And now there is a lot more interest in that part of the world in, in, in those kind of services. Is Iran a part of this? Iran actually has the largest uh, chunk of what they call Islamic banking. Uh, but a lot of Iranians have also, because of absence of financial uh, uh, capabilities in our country, have put their money outside in a lot of these uh, uh, funds in, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in Kuala Lumpur. I mean, estimates are that upwards of a third of Iran's oil revenue annually leaves the country in form of investments. I mean, it's a country of 70 million people. Despite its hobbled economy, it is still a very wealthy country, and there is enough economic activity that generates a lot of money. And this money finds its way into in international markets, essentially through these medium of Islamic banking and other services in, in, in these parts of the world. I see. So sanctions, in a sense, does not have an impact on that. 
Sanctions makes it a lot more difficult. Uh, Islamic banking now is part of Main Street banking. There is, a, for instance, Islamic bond index on Dow Jones. Uh, every major Amer uh, European bank now offers Islamic financial services. Uh, they, they are competing very aggressively. For instance, the city of London is competing very aggressively with Dubai and Kuala Lumpur to become the main hub for issuing of Islamic bonds. And therefore, it, it, they're not necessarily separable as, as easily. Ultimately, a money that goes into an Islamic mm -hmm. bank in Dubai would end up uh, you know, on, on part of the assets in Citibank. And uh, so, yes, the sanctions do matter because they, they do interfere. But, uh, but there are other channels that are, as, as you say, that are not through mainstream here. But they are interconnected. So the downturn of the Western financial markets doesn't ultimately redound to the benefit of these emerging Islamic markets. Yes and no. Uh, in the sense that Islamic, Islamic markets tend to, have, to, tend to have been very heavy in real estate because they look for tangible assets to associate with, with investment. And the, fall, the global fall of the real estate market does impact where their money has been. Um, and, and therefore, particularly for instance, uh, in, in the Persian Gulf, places like Dubai have, have uh, been downsized severely uh, as a consequence of the collapse of the real estate market. And, and it does impact them. But, but the perception of the, on the street in the Muslim world is that the reason that f Western financial systems got into trouble was because they lacked an ethical grounding. Mm and that uh, you, know, you can bet on anything and you can con conceive of any possible financial product without any kind of an ethical, legal, moral regulation that would prevent you from that. So the perception of the average Muslim is that Islamic finance is superior because it has certain moral breaks as to how far you can go with risky ventures, even though it may not be true. Uh, but, but, but the perception is there. <laughs> I see. So just uh, since I know we're... Um we're running down the clock a little bit. I wanted to return to the elections in Iran. You mentioned at the beginning that you thought this was one of the most important elections, both for Iran and for the international picture. And I wonder why you say that. What, what is so important about this election to the Iranian domestic political scene? First of all, I think every election in Iran is important because it's a ve one of the very few places in the Middle East that actually has uh, an election that is meaningful. In other words, these are not open elections, but the results are not foretold, and, and people do lose. I mean, Iran is actually the only country in the Middle East to have former heads of state alive in their own countries. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> so, so every time the Iranians go through this exercise, uh, a new generation learns about voting. Right. A new generation does it. Uh, I mean, the Iranians become much more acclimated with the small d democracy. Mm -hmm. So that matters. Secondly, I think because um, the Ahmadinejad experiment in Iran was such an extreme experiment for even the average Iranian people at every level. He took power from the middle class and is trying to take it back and put it among the lower class. He adopted a very uh, confrontational foreign policy, as we know, on multiple fronts. And then he has also debased uh, Iran's economy and, and government institutions and the like. So the key issue is that uh, can, can he be stopped at this stage or will he have another five years of pursuing the same policies and another five years of Ahmadinejad would put Iran at a very different place. Right. So it's a fateful in a election more so than the previous ones. And he's facing challenges from two directions at the moment. One, the, sort of the major challenger from the reform camp is Mir Hussein Mousavi, who was prime minister in the 80s. And on the other side, there, there does seem to be a block of conservatives who are looking to stop him. So what do we make of the emergence of this conservative challenge, and who do they represent, in your view? It could potentially be very serious. There are two groups of conservatives in Iran. There are the hardline, militant conservatives, and then you have the sort of more pragmatic conservatives. I guess, you know, in an American context, it's kind of like a McCain-Huckabee fight. <laughs> Uh, uh, sort of the old, uh, the old guard. Who is who? Yeah, well, I, I won't say which ones ought to be, but, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, in the sense that, that you know, the conservatives in Iran are not one bloc. Uh, they, they differ on foreign policy issues, but also they differ on the economy. There is a group of conservatives who are very mercantile and middle class and private sector oriented. And then there's a group of uh, conservatives who are populist. Uh, 
Now, the, the conservatives that have come in are, if you would, the elite of the conservative group. They, they include not only um, the, the Mohsen Rezai, who's a former Revolutionary Guards commander, but also a senior advisor to the Supreme Leader, the mayor of Tehran, and uh, also uh, the current speaker of Iran's parliament, who was the previous uh, nuclear negotiator. They have created this alliance against Ahmadinejad, and that's a, quite a formidable alliance, and, and it could potentially divide the vote in favor of the reformists. And that's the reverse of what happened last time, hmm. when the reformist vote was divided in favor of the conservatives. And on the reformist side, the candidate who seems to be, oh, there are really two candidates. Um, there's Karubi is still running, and then we have Musavi. Musavi is something of a dark horse. He's been sort of out of the political eye for 20 years. Um, what do we know about where he stands on the crucial issues now, including human rights, the economy, and foreign policy? Well, human rights won't figure, uh, <laughs> or at least publicly in the, in, in, in the campaign, although he does promise to make a life a lot easier for the average middle class. But there are several things about Musavi that are key. One is that he was Iran's prime minister during the Iran-Iraq war. And therefore, uh, he has an aura of having been a tough manager during a very critical time in Iran's history. Secondly, he was a hardline populist at that point in time. So he can compete uh, with Ahmadinejad for the vote of the poor. He was one of the original generation of the revolution. So Ahmadinejad cannot claim to have been his, uh, you know, to be holier than thou with him mm -hmm. about who represents uh, revolutionary ideals. Uh, but the, 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 the critical issue is this, is that Musavi claims to have been transformed over these years into a reformist, something like what we see with leftist Latin American presidents who later on became pro-market. But he also, when he was prime minister, the supreme leader then was the president, and they were constantly fighting. And there is a part of the supreme leader who thinks of Musavi as somebody who was once his equal, and he will not accept the supreme leader as his uh, you know, boss when he comes in. And it's possible that the supreme leader will just worry on that personal issue with him, and which is one, the one reason why a lot of Iranians may actually vote for him, mm. believing he's the one person who can stand, <laughs> stand up to up. the supreme leader. <laughs> Um, I saw some, some numbers today that were really quite striking. There's an opinion poll, and I guess we know these are not terribly reliable in Iran, but it showed Musavi and Ahmadinejad neck and neck, about one percentage point apart with Musavi in the lead. It's, it's quite correct, but you see, the, in Iran, everything comes down to voter turnout, because there is a 20% of the, of the population who will vote hard right, and they always show up for voting. And if you don't have voter high turnout, in, particularly in the big cities like Tehran, Ahmadinejad will likely win. So a low turnout vote is to his benefit, and that's why he engages in all kinds of uh, intimidation tactics, including arrest of foreign journalists, arrest of student leaders, breaking up of civil society groups, because he wants the voters, particularly the middle class voters, to stay home. So you know the, the polls are good indicators, but it really comes down to if they show up. Right. Well, I think we're um, running out of time, so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much.